And yet that question is still being asked today, as in who is Mr. Putin? Might he actually uh, openly invade Ukraine? Uh, what is his game? What are his political designs? What does he want? The most amazing thing to me is that everyone is still caught on this petard. Who is Mr. Putin and what will he do next? I think we have a sense of who is Mr. Putin and yet we don't know, especially when oil prices are low and uh, he has to distract attention at home. We don't know what Mr. Putin will do next. My trip to Ukraine in 2014 was really uh, an amazing one for me at many levels. On a personal level and on a professional level uh, in terms of looking at how a war can be created by those who want to gin up a sectarian conflict. I've seen that before. I've spent decades covering the Middle East. I have watched how factions in the Middle East, even before the current horrors in Syria and Iraq, I had watched during the Lebanon Civil War how outside powers fueled sectarian warfare between factions. Uh, I saw that with my own eyes when I went to Donetsk. Uh, this was in May of 2014. It was before the worst of the worst, what we have seen since. But what was both fascinating and tragic to observe was how fears and information could be manipulated in a way that could uh, turn people uh, to support so-called rebels who clearly did not have real support in the community but were playing on the fears of Russian speakers, especially elderly Russian speakers who were effectively being brainwashed by Russian media, which was the only news to which they had access uh, since links to Kiev media and television had been cut off. When I came uh, to Donetsk, it was still possible to fly into the airport. There still was an airport. It amazes me now to think that that airport sits in ruins. I stayed at the Park Hotel. I just read this week that OSCE observers who were staying at the Park Hotel, so I guess it's still standing, um, had four of their vehicles destroyed in the parking lot there, so they're unable uh, to carry out their mission of trying to observe what is going on in the fighting and whether the Minsk Accord is being violated uh, yet again. But what was so revealing about my trip to Donetsk uh, was uh, going to the headquarters of the so-called rebels, uh, which was in what had formerly been uh, the regional administrative headquarters, a building of 11 stories in the heart of town, uh, which had been surrounded by barbed wire by the rebels. and and there were guards all around, and there were large numbers of elderly uh, Russian speakers just sort of hanging out there and eager to talk, and many of them recalling the glory days of the Red Army fighting the fascists, and fearful that the fascists were coming back to kill them again. Uh, this is the message they were getting, many of them veterans of World War II, and this is what they believed. But going into this administrative, administration building really laid bare the essence of what the rebel movement was comprised of. And although much carnage and killing has happened since, Nothing much has changed in terms of the composition of the leadership. The names have changed, but the nature of the rebel leadership, as, as I understand it from talking to people who've come out from that area, and, and uh, as many people as I can who have access to information and reading the news reportage, 
it simply seems to parallel what I saw then, which is that the leadership of the rebels was comprised by people who were run by Moscow, who had lived most of their lives in Moscow, and who, uh, if, uh, and I couldn't prove this, although it was said to be true, if they were not actually FSB agents, they had connections with Russian intelligence, and they assembled around them a group of misfits and ne'er-do-wells who were inhabiting the 11th floor, the 11 floors of this building, which one had to walk up and down because the elevators were no longer in service. And so walking up and down these 11 floors regularly, um, what I got to meet was unhappy uh, teenagers, uh, elderly veterans, uh, thuggish looking young men with cudgels, uh, and uh, at the time, uh, the leader spokesman of the rebels was a man named Dennis Pushilin, who uh, had a reputation as, as being um, a, a pyramid scamster uh, from, from Moscow. In fact, his nickname was the Russian Madoff. And when I tried to talk to Pushilin about his background, he shoved me, uh, and one of his guards pointed uh, a Klashnikov at me, and I decided that such questions were better left unasked. Um, but in going around Donetsk at that time, I still found many Ukrainians, some of Russian descent, a few, less, I found a few who were not of uh, Russian, but everyone, you know, Russian speakers, um, and some few Ukrainian speakers, but what fascinated me was Russian speakers, businessmen, who did not want this separatist violence to be stirred up. Uh, I met a group of businessmen in Donetsk who were trying to organize supply lines and were raising money and food chains to supply the Ukrainian soldiers who, as you know at that time, were very disorganized and very short in material and even unable to get enough food to sustain them. These were Russian speakers. They may have been unhappy with Kiev. They may have been disgusted at some of the corruption that had pervaded governments in Kiev. They may have felt, and many did, that the east of Ukraine got short shrift when it came to resources or attention, and that the government wasn't paying enough attention to the needs of the citizens in the east. But they did not want a war. They did not want to be part of Russia. They did not want to be killing fellow Ukrainians. My guess is that the many people I spoke to who spoke in that fashion have long since fled uh, the East if they had the means to leave. So I came away, uh, you know, with an understanding uh, that I actually had expected of how war could be stirred up. I went on to Odessa and I got a further education. I, I, I say education, although it didn't surprise me. I, I've spent a lot of time in Russia. Um, and. Uh, I, an education in the ways of penetration and, and stirring up civil war. You know, I should say that on my last trip to Russia, I was there during the elections in Russia in 2012, I had a long dinner with Boris Nemtsov, whom I had known for many years, uh, you know, a wonderful figure who was assassinated, uh, you know, months ago. And so, you know, I had no illusions uh, but again, I, I saw after, and, and heard uh, in many conversations with uh, Odessa residents, again, a place, Odessa, where just about everybody speaks Russian, I saw how provocations could stir up conflict. I saw how deliberate provocations could be used to try to stir up civil war. As I'm sure most of you are aware, 
when the rebellion first began in eastern Ukraine, everybody was speculating on whether um, R Russia and, and Putin would make a march uh, to, to Odessa. There was a lot of speculation that Mariupol would, would be uh, attacked on a massive scale, and then there would be movement towards Odessa, and finally an effort to link up with Transdenestria. So when I was in Odessa, it was not long after this tragic episode that you may recall, when 42 people burned to death in a trade union building. And I talked to many people who had been there, including uh, a, a computer businessman who had been the head of self-defense forces in Odessa. Uh, he had been on the Maidan, and he had helped organize, he was a black belt, he had helped organize volunteers in Odessa to try to keep any marches that took place peaceful. Uh, this was the goal of the self-defense forces there. And, and from what he and others told me, you may remember this incident, there had been a deliberate provocation in a march that had happened after a soccer match. And two people had been shot dead from among the fans of the soccer players. The shooters came out of nowhere and disappeared into the crowd. This angered the soccer fans, some of whom were a little thuggish. They then marched on a camp, an encampment of pro-Russian, not even rebels, just sort of people who were demonstrating pro-Russia. And these, some of these people panicked, ran into the trade union building. Molotov cocktails were exchanged. The building caught on fire and 42 people died. Moscow presented this as a deliberate attempt to incinerate supporters of Russia. Um, what I learned, and this is corroborated by many interviews, um, was that the self-defense forces who were not pro-Russia, just pro-peace and quiet, actually mounted human chains to try to rescue people out of the windows of the burning building. This was not an attempt to incinerate people. It was a tragic accident where many locals who were against what Russia was doing and who were not uh, pro-rebel risked their lives to try to save people from the burning building. But again, this was an attempt to stir up conflict between communities that then could be used to possibly justify a bigger invasion through southern Ukraine. It didn't work because Odessa, I think maybe to the surprise of Moscow, despite its Russian-speaking culture, was not majority interested in secession. People weren't looking for that. And so the rebellion in Odessa never took off the way I suspect uh, some in Moscow might have hoped for. But the point of talking about how a manufactured rebellion can take roots is to say that I think one of the greatest difficulties in dealing with what Russia is doing in Ukraine is that it is a hybrid war, it is a war by subterfuge, and I think too often politicians are wary of calling it by its real name. I mean, for example, when uh, President Putin says there are no Russian troops in uh, uh, Ukraine, or there have been none, everyone knows that is totally untrue. But it's not politic to call it a lie to his face, although uh, Secretary Kerry has said on occasion that it's a lie. But somehow, the vague imagery, the manipulated nature of what this conflict is or isn't, is allowed to fester. And I